Hello, good morning, good day, good evening around the world, and welcome to the Voice Vibe podcast. My name is Philly Paul, I'm your host, and I'm excited to welcome my guest speaker today, Greg West. Welcome, Greg. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me, Philippe. My pleasure. I'm going to be managing here a couple of screens while we're doing this. And first of all, I just want to introduce Greg as I know Greg. We met, I don't know, it was about four years ago, five, four or five years ago. And um, Greg drove from California to Las Vegas to, to take a voice lesson. <laughs> I didn't know who he was, and uh, but I remember we just got together in a, f a friend's living room and sang for, I don't know, a couple of hours. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And since then, it's just been reconnecting over the years. Grace come out and stay with me and the family, and I've visited him in LA, and we've worked together and collaborated on a lot of things. Uh, one thing I really appreciate about Greg is he is perfect example of how amazing progress can be made through many little steps over time. And it's pretty amazing. I, I think um, one thing that's one thing I, I do appreciate a lot about Greg is his relentless pursuit of knowledge about singing and also just willing to be wrong and have disastrous fails and learn from them and figure out the right way to go. <laughs> so why don't you tell us a little bit about, um, about how all of this came to be. Tell us a little bit about your story. Sure, yeah. So I got interested in singing um, through some acting classes that I was taking on a scholarship. Um, I was very lucky to have that opportunity. And the acting teacher, Bethany Price, told me um, that she was directing a musical and she asked me if I could sing. And up to that point, I was probably about 17, 16, somewhere around there. I thought that I could sing <laughs> uh, because I had heard little offhand comments here and there. Uh, you know, like, oh, yes, you have a nice voice when I would sing, you know, something along to the radio. Um, but and then I kind of liked the feeling of singing. So I thought, well, surely I must be able to sing. Uh, so then <laughs> I went to the audition um, and um, it was just it was children's theater. You know, it was a children's theater production. And I was very uh, sorely <laughs> say I was in for a rude awakening. Let's put it that way, that uh, I could not sing. I had a hard time following along to the accompaniment accompaniment of the piano um and you know i was kind of stubborn i was not used to starting things and feeling like behind on them uh, especially when i thought that i was good at them so up until this point in my life it'd be like well math yeah i'm i'm good at that i'm you know as good as the top kids in the class at math science you know whatever right. uh, whatever it was uh, can you hear me okay do we have a a, a lag issue I can hear you okay. You looks like your video feed did freeze up. Oh, I see it. Okay, weird. Uh, there we go. There, there we go. go. I don't know why I did that, but well, uh, <laughs> let me know if that happens again. I just okay. fix to turn it on and off. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I, I did. Um, I, I was used to doing well at things. I, di I didn't do well when I first tried to sing and that bothered me. So it kind of, you know, <laughs> got under my skin and I wanted to figure out how to do it. And one of my first frustrations with singing was just my range. You know, um, it was because I could, you know, we would go up the scale in these warm ups, and I just remember having this huge break in the voice that I just couldn't get rid of, and I would start to struggle hard around E flat uh, four or so. Just a very, very difficult zone <laughs> now uh, appearing in the voice. And I remember hearing the other uh, singers, um, you know, in some uh, productions uh, that I would was, was doing, musicals, and I would hear them go, uh, higher and, and they would just hit the notes and it was like I was supposed to be able to hit the notes, you know, it'd be written there in the score, 
you got to hit this G in the song, hit this F. And I would be like, <laughs> why can't I do it? And then I would hear somebody else doing it and be like, what, like, what is wrong with me? <laughs> what is wrong with my voice? Why can't I just do what I'm supposed to be able to do? Um, so that kind of started my search into improving my voice from that point on. It was really because I lacked the natural ability to sing high uh, and I and I was pestered by it and that that was the beginning of it and it evolved so many times over the years of you know eventually figuring out how to do high notes and coordinate that then to changing my priority into priorities into caring about different things but um, you know that was that was what happened along the way during the first three years, I would always record these little clips of me singing. So I would record little like uh, tests, you know, I started I started recording 10 seconds of me singing something to listen back as feedback to see, you know, did that sound right? Did that sound like how I wanted it to sound? I would be mimicking singers, for example, copying them seeing was that the right sound, you know? <laughs> uh, so I would I would do that. And then eventually, after about those three years had passed, I took all of those singing clips and I made a compilation of those three years. And I annotated that video and I published it to, to YouTube. So I just kind of wrote, here's what I was working on in this part. This is what happened to my voice here. And it's about a 10 minute video. I published it on YouTube called Three Year Singing Transformation. Uh, and it went viral. And that was really what started my, then my journey getting into teaching. Because at the time I was just, you know, a singer trying to improve my voice and interested in information that could help me do that. Uh, but then people started asking me, how did you do that with your voice? And I was also in, involved in online singing groups. So, um, and also just in classes, like in person that I would be taking at schools, I would freely explain to people, oh, well, this is what I did. Cause you know, I just did it like last year. I just figured out how to do this thing. So it's like fresh in my mind. Here's the steps that I took. So through that, I, that was how I started teaching very naturally, very gradually. People started just wanting to know, you know, how I did something and I would explain to them, this is, you know, I did A, B, C, and D. And then, you know, here we are, got that result. Uh, through the singing transformation video, a lot of people started asking me, can you teach me how to do this? You know, how did you develop your mixed voice like this? So I, that was how I, I really got started. Um, then becoming a, a professional uh, teacher was people interested in some of the skills I had acquired and wanting me to teach them. So I began to teach more and more. And in the, over the last now, probably it's been the last three years, I've been doing this full time, which is cool. Um, and yeah, just always a learning journey, uh, a learning journey, always uh, learning more and, you know, figuring out more sounds in the voice and <laughs> becoming a better singer, becoming a better teacher. So, well, how has this changed your life? Um, <clears throat> gosh, well, I think I used singing initially actually as a positive uh, coping mechanism to deal with depression. So it changed my life. Uh, it probably helped me in a lot of ways. So I can only imagine where things would have gone without that because singing is such an intensely stimulative activity. It demands a lot of focus and a lot of concentration. Um, and it's so, there's so much happening, so many sensations happening. So it's hard to be depressed when you are engaged in an activity like that, <laughs> you know? Uh, so when you're kind of zoned in and you're in the moment, it's like, it's hard to be depressed snowboarding down a mountain, <laughs> you know, you're trying not to fall, <laughs> you know? So, um, I think that and having something that I could work on routinely and and make little progress with was exciting and it really helped me actually um, with managing depression. So it, that helped me in a huge way as far as um, learning to to sing. I think I, I never really had the belief that I couldn't do it, you know. So I think it just kind of affirmed what was already there. Mastering learning to sing is just like you know. I I, I think I've always thought you can do anything, you can be anything. And that kind of mastering that also helped me cement that in there, that belief as well. So I think that's, that's given me more confidence as a person that, yeah, you know, 
could do this and then I could probably, I could take on other endeavors, you know, uh, yeah. that I want to do. So I'd say it's affected my life that way. Um, got, uh, I think working with so many different people as a teacher has really affected how I see people and how I can talk to people and how I understand how like learning works, you know? So, uh, when I learn something, you know, <laughs> now I think about it differently when I learn a different subject, you know, I would say a lot has a lot has changed in my understanding of people and how, and myself of how, you know, how learning works in general. Yeah. Well, that's a wonderful mindset. I guess we have that in common. I think it's really important. Um, <clears throat> there's everybody's going to deal with self doubt, right? And I always also, okay, you know me, maybe not everybody that watches this video or listens to this podcast knows my story, but I, I was not planning on becoming a, a singer. I was not at all what I, what I thought when I was young, it shifted when I was about 18, but up till then it was, you know, medic medicine, becoming a surgeon. Um, I, I was really into, to airplanes and thinking about becoming a pilot and, and then the singing just kind of happened, but I felt, I felt a pull towards that. Like this was what I was meant to do. And I never doubted either that it was possible. Um, but a lot of people doubted me along the way when I was at the university and I had a great education. I loved that the experience there, but I remember very clearly one of the, the this, I was really bad at acting in the beginning. I was just so bad. <laughs> I was so <laughs> stiff. And I remember the acting teacher, uh, professor there saying, I just don't think this is, this is for you. I just don't, I think if you got in a show, you do a good job, but, uh, your auditions are terrible. <laughs> and, and I remember uh, just, wow. be, uh, just having, uh, defiance, um, not, not aggressive, just this internal defiance, like, uh, no, I'll just work on it. I'm going to work, I'm going to work yeah. and I'm going to make it happen. And, um, just this natural defiance of like, no, uh, I'm going to do this because I, I firmly believed all my life. If you put in the work, the results come yeah. and, and the progress happens over time. And then, you know, I think I graduated two years later and, and sat down with her and I had booked out an entire season as an actor <laughs> <laughs> and I was studying, you know, singing and musicals and, there we go. and, um, that was, that was great <clears throat> for me to experience. And then I went on and I went around the world and I performed and I performed in all kinds of different genres. And then I decided at some point after I was very well known, at least in Europe as a musical artist, I did a lot of musicals. I decided that, um, I wanted to become an opera singer. I don't know. I just always loved it. And then I went back to school and a lot of people were just saying, why are you doing this? You know, why, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, and and uh teachers and professors also just not being maybe maybe you're not a tenor maybe you're a baritone maybe this and i'm like you guys this is ridiculous and and while i was in my second year of the master's program studying opera i was already booked out for the full season as an opera soloist but a lot of people in the musical world at different theaters they didn't want to hire me for opera because they knew me as a musical performer mm. And I went and auditioned for people that didn't know me as an opera singer and I changed my stage name and they hired me. So <laughs> you run into a lot of crazy stuff yeah. in, in this phase, but the, it was just resilience. So I think uh, I'd like to communicate to, to the audience. Um, it's so important your mindset as a singer and I know I have seen incredible transformations with my clients. So I really appreciate you sharing how this has changed your life because 
a lot I've seen similar things. People go from closet singer to singing the national anthem at a sporting event. You know, people telling me they're 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 social. They feel more comfortable socially. There's just so many things that change when one's confidence improves with your own singing. So yeah, I, I think singing is like regarded as one of the like top fears <laughs> that yeah. people have, right? So it makes sense that that learning to sing and then also learning to perform like that imbues you with some confidence because you're doing right. something that very few people have the chutzpah to take on, you know, and uh, and to to conquer, you know. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's empowering, and I I love that that story of having to kind of overcome through some internal defiance that you said, and I didn't have anybody tell me. I was a terrible actor. Luckily, I got that acting scholarship because I had some natural <laughs> uh, affinity towards acting. It uh, didn't extend to the singing, but <laughs> with acting, it was there. I never really had anybody tell me, you can't do this. But I did have people say, for sure, you know, you're a baritone. What are you doing trying to sing high? And and I definitely had a, a real spark of defiance there. I was like, no. I was like, what? I was like, I'm going to figure this out. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to figure out how to sing high. <laughs> and uh, and it, it's just very funny now because when I sing, uh, you know, it, most people now recognize me uh, as a tenor and they say, oh, you're a tenor. And now it's funny. The spark of defiance goes the other way. And I'm like, how do you, how do you know? I can't be a baritone. <laughs> so, now, so, now, so it's backfire now, basically, you know, uh, when you, you, it's like saying, don't walk on the grass, you know, <laughs> it just, uh, lights that under me and I go, I, you know, no, <laughs> I'm going to figure this out. So, um, I have encountered that along the way, how to, a voice teacher tell me, you know, your voice just isn't meant to do that. Like, or you, your voice specifically doesn't do that sound, you know? Oh, I hate it when people, when I hear that, I just hate it when I hear that. Yeah. So I was, I was like, mm, nope. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I'm going to work on this. And you know what? My voice does do that sound. <laughs> yeah. Years later, years, you know, it took a while, but it does do that sound, you know? So uh, yeah, that's what I try to share with people is, yeah, but, but you're right. That, that tenacity, that, that drive, that, that work towards doing it, you know, and that, that resilience, I think is the word you said. Yeah. It's so key. Yeah. It can be frustrating. I mean, you know, we've talked privately. I've, I've had my frustrations. I'm sure you've had a few frustrations along your way. Right. Yeah. And some, I mean, I used to say literally there's a whole different pressure level when you, when you kind of established as an artist, uh, you have to live up to your own reputation. It's like, I'm singing this Saturday. I'm, I'm mildly nervous, but I'm only nervous because I have to now live up to my own personal expectations of myself. And people are coming and people see me and have seen me uh, sing. And so the expectation level set. So it's like, you, you can't go and just screw up. You know, you got to go and give a performance where people are like, oh my gosh, wow. Yeah. You know, and if you don't, then you didn't live up to your own reputation. It's a different right. stress level. But let's talk about that as well, because this is um, we can kind of segue into uh, what you wanted to share today. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah. really important to me that people hear this is this did not happen overnight. And there resilience is not it can sound like oh my gosh it's so hard it's going to take forever it's not that you are going to run into frustration but it's right. just about putting time in the game it's just yep. time in the game and enjoying the process right and that over time produces incredible results so yeah uh, What's yeah, I love that. Enjoying the, enjoying the process because <laughs> I really did enjoy this process. I really yeah, and you enjoyed it. Yeah. You, did, you yeah. didn't have any moments where you're like, this is not going to work. I hate oh, this. Course. Yes, yes. But I enjoyed, but I enjoyed so many moments in the process. And overall, you know, I enjoyed it a lot. Otherwise, I wouldn't have kept doing it. So I think you have to make learning to sing enjoyable. Mm. Or you're not, or you're not going to do it. And it's something that I tell people when they're practicing too, is like, you know, it needs to make sense to you <laughs> on some, to some degree what yeah. you're doing and you need to be, you need to be curious and want to practice and want to figure it out. Otherwise 
there's not going to be any motivation, you know? Right. I, I read on Reddit, uh, like probably a month or two ago, somebody saying, how do I motivate myself to warm up? And I just thought, wow, what a question. Like the whole paradigm here is, is like, is messed yeah. up that, that you need, oh, is my video frozen? No, I'm good. Um, that you would need to motivate yourself to do your warm up. Like I'm always motivated to warm up because <laughs> I want to sing. I want to make my voice. I want to find the sounds that I'm interested in using in my songs. I want to make, I want to, to shape my voice for the day mm -hmm. and, and make it start to work right. It's like, I want to tune up the machine in the morning right. so that I can take it out onto the track and, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. and have fun and play, you know, I want yeah. to stretch before my game so that I can feel like I'm going to be at a hundred percent. So the fact that, that they need motivation and they're not motivated tells me there's something wrong with the warm up. There's something wrong with the exercise, yes. which yes. to me is what I want to talk about a bit today, kind of linked to it. Um, I wanted to, to say that, um, a lot of singing, learning to sing, and what you're practicing should be like is finding little mini obsessions uh, with the voice, finding little things that um, you can kind of hyper focus on. So it could be all sorts of things. It could be a specific type of sound, a specific quality of voice that you're that you're looking to make. Like you really like breathy sounds, you know. So something like. Uh, well, you done done me and you bet I felt it. So this sounds a lot of air. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's uh, maybe it's a vocal effect, you know, like you've got a, a creak in the voice. Uh, and you want to sing with a whoa. And you like the sound of it. You're like, what? Are what is that sound? What are they doing? Become, pick a thing, <laughs> you know, a sound that you're drawn to and you, you get obsessed with trying to do it yourself, mm -hmm. find it in your body, feel how it works. Um, but it doesn't have to be a sound. It could be something like, what is relaxation in singing? Like you want to relax, you know, you want vocal mm -hmm. freedom. Maybe it's this like idea of vocal freedom. Maybe you become a little bit obsessed with that and you try to figure out how can I relax? Can I relax fully? What needs to be relaxed? You know, yeah. what needs to be engaged? What needs to be tense? So you start to really investigate that you need to. And when you do this, you really take um, singing and your own singing journey into your own hands. You decide, you know, <laughs> you can decide what these little mini obsessions of yours are. And this mm -hmm. is really how I made the progress that I made is I kind of jumped from one thing to a next to the next as it interested as it interested me. Oh, this person's got so much air. How do I do that breathy vocal? Oh, vibrato. You know, how do I do vibrato? High notes, right? The high notes were the first thing, but they certainly weren't the last. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so uh, yeah, how do I do high notes? A uh, mixed voice. You know, okay, what's belting? How do I belt? You know, you explore what's what these different sounds are that people are doing and and different things that people are talking about and you try to understand it and you focus on one little zone of your voice at a right. time. And when you do that you and you dive in deep, you go deep into it, you learn so much about how your voice works, even if they're not necessarily sounds that you plan on using. I've explored, for example, opera sounds. You know, we've had some opera lessons together and I don't plan to sing opera. So some of you go, why are you trying to sing, you know, <laughs> these opera arias, uh, yeah. you know, for fun, for fun. And because I got a little obsession of how are they making that sound? Mm -hmm. How do I shape my, you know, voice to be able to do that? What are they doing? That's helped me, especially as a teacher, because I understand a, a wide palette of sounds and I'm able to right. help people that are interested in things that I'm not necessarily interested in. But even as a, as a singer, something that is remarkable about great singers that maybe people don't know necessarily is that they're excellent mimickers. If you give somebody like Ariana Grande, uh, you know, it's a copy X singer. They're actually, she's actually going to do a pretty good job. Singers mm -hmm. have really good ears and they have, so they can hear sound really well, hear little subtle differences and they can control their body to copy it. A lot like voice actors, voice actors and singers share a lot of crossover in that they have a, 
They have a control over their body and an understanding of sound that they can hear something and go, I know where that is in my body. So when you explore with your little mini obsession into a certain direction with your voice and try to understand how this specific zone works, you really develop skills that are translatable. Because even if you don't want that specific sound, the process of learning how to create it translates into learning how to do other things because yeah. it's one voice in a holistic sense. Right. There is, there is one voice. I mean, there's many different things your voice can do and you could say there's many different voices, but it's the same mechanism to create sound fundamentally obeys the same principles and laws of physics. So when you yeah. learn one thing, it translates into being able to do other things because it's the yeah. same system producing it. So yeah, I got I, I, I got to jump in on that. That's so because one of the things um, just tip from me, uh, we're going to get back to this is really important. Tip from me, I a lot of a lot of time with my clients, I'll spend time helping them to get consistent at one thing. <laughs> because the ability to be consistent at one sound teaches you to be consistent. And then if you explore another sound, you're going to be looking to how do I stay consistent in this sound? There's little things from I have people trying to, you know, sing in awe, you know, simple exercise, ma, 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 ma. And inevitably people will be going, ma, 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 ma. And I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you don't realize that if you just if your tongue moves a little bit while you're doing the ah, ma, that that whole sound is now fluctuating. It's yeah. being distorted. If your mouth's not all the way open, ma, every little thing that moves is changing your overall sound. So when you get good at being consistent at one shape, one sound, it teaches you to be consistent in a way at every sound. Mm -hmm. So I really am a big yeah. believer in that. And I wanted to talk about, I love this, you know, having, having, finding and indulging in little obsessions, right? But let's talk about the reality is uh, when you're indulging in an obsession, you might, well, you're not going to get it right all the time. It's going to take a while to get it right. And, and at some point, um, everybody needs a little help. I mean, you didn't do this completely on your own. I didn't do this on my own. We have to say, yes, I, I, obviously I spent my 10,000 plus hours, you've spent your 10,000 plus hours, but what's the value in failure? Mm -hmm. And what's the value, at what point do you seek help? Um, give me one second. I don't know why my camera just decided to uh, <laughs> turn off. Yeah, we got it. We got a switch view. I like that. You got a double camera. <laughs> got it. Well, this is cool too. It's working. Okay, good. Yeah, I don't know why it just uh, just kind of <clears throat> shut off, but it'll uh, it'll pop back on in a second. Yeah, we just got camera view too. Go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yes. Okay. Let's see. It may be this that turned off. Let's try that. Well, you check that out. I'll just share a little bit about my experience. So when I, yeah, go ahead. when I was going, wanting to maybe find a rock sound, right? Yeah. There you go. That, yeah, that's that very, blurry? a tiny bit, but it'll probably focus in. It's not uh, automatic. So, <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah. It, I've got a... a little blurry. There it is. That's in focus. We'll go with that. Cool. Um, so you were saying yes. about, you want to share about your finding a rock? Well, just, you know, when I, when I was looking in having a little obsession, maybe of finding a classical sound or finding this, you know, how is this singer? I love listening to making this sound. Hmm. Um, inevitably you're going to make progress. You have to do it all on your own, right? You have to find this sound within your own body, but we have this, this wall of perception versus reality. And my perception of how that sound was created wasn't always the reality of how it's yeah. created. And so it's, you can, you get to a point where you bang your head against the wall 
And I think that's the important point in your self-discovery where you're like, you know what? I'm, I'm really not getting any further. Oh, yeah. I got to get some guidance here. For sure. I've had, um, I wanted to say um, about that as well, that with many obsessions, a lot of that is, can be external. A mini obsession be, can be your vocal coach pointing out a hole in your voice, a, a gap, an area, a deficit of control that you have over your voice. So they might say, listen, like you said, you can't keep a consistent ah vowel, you know? Um, you know, you were doing ah, but my fear is ah, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the, probably the most common uh, <laughs> version people will do. Um, that's, that is a control deficit. So if it, these, these obsessions can come from external sources and many of mine did many from just fellow singers or from um from you know uh reading something and somebody talking about a certain concept getting it from there getting it from a vocal coach getting it from a vocal pedagogy system like complete vocal technique or a still voice training or sls speech level singing or a classical idea like what does it mean to open the throat get obsessed on that what does it feel like how does it change your sound if you open your throat right whatever open throat means um so you know th that helped me so much of okay what is overdrive you know what i mean i wanted to understand <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> <is> overdrive yeah. <laughs> what the heck is overdrive what's the difference between overdrive and edge you know i got obsessed about those little things. And there was no way that I could learn what overdrive and what edge were without taking lessons. Like there was just no way I tried. <laughs> okay. So you can do a lot by yourself. You can, you can talk with your friends and you really should have singing friends. You should have singing friends and they can be the source of, of, you know, some inspiration and of a little obsession because they'll tell you what they're obsessed with. Oh, I'm working on this right now. All you have to say when you communicate to another singer to find out what their little obsession is, you say, what are you working on? <laughs> That's their obsession. <laughs> you work on your little obsession. Yeah. So good singers do that. They have a little focus. You know, I'm really work working on this tone right now. I'm trying to bring more of this into my voice at the yeah. moment, you know? So you need to, you need to find those things and adopt them. So for, for, you know, me, I've never been afraid to ask people. I would always ask singers. It started with me just asking other singers, how are you singing those high notes? Because I was obsessed with the high notes, you know? Yeah, yeah. How, how are you singing that? Could you always sing those high notes? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what are you thinking about? What are you doing? That is getting feedback. That is getting help. I would ask singers that I was doing stuff with. I would ask the musical directors. I started to take voice lessons because, you know, evidently what I was doing by myself <laughs> wasn't working, you know? So right. you have to get obsessed with something. Yeah. But then, but then you really need to find a competent guide. It doesn't have to be a, a professional teacher. Um, you can try to get help from a friend. I mean, I figured some things out about vocal runs from a friend that was a lot better at vocal runs than me. Mm -hmm. uh, and that led to some like, some epiphanies. So you can definitely learn things from colleagues um, and from from studying, you know, with, with singers, a little trick, a little way of thinking about something that they explain, that can be it. But obviously, if you work with a really competent teacher, they're going to be doing this a lot and they're hopefully going to be better at getting you there faster <laughs> than yeah. the, the trick that your friend uses, your colleague uses to think about it. Because their way, you know, as a singer, when you're looking for a sound, when you find the thing, the one thing that works, you kind of settle on that. You're like, cool, I got it. Yay. Yeah. But as a singing teacher, you usually have like an arsenal of things to try to get somebody in a specific direction because you're used to problem solving uh, how to get singers from a to b to c to z um over and over again so you're very familiar with like okay if we get this pitfall right here let's try these five things uh if these don't work we can try these other things you like a professional that's what a professional teacher should do so which is why it's important on your point of like i was obsessed with an opera sound i bet you didn't go to a rock singer <laughs> When you were obsessed with a classical sound, and I bet when you were obsessed with a classical sound, you didn't go to a rock singer, which is yeah. why it's like the importance of finding a teacher that fits to whatever that obsession is. That's always what I've done is I've heard, oh, this singer, this teacher is really good at this sound. I ask them about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't ask them about things that I don't think that they're particularly qualified in. And yeah. that's just, that's how it is. All, every teacher's got their zones of like, you know, 
um, specialties, you know, sure. just like doctors, <laughs> you know, so uh, everybody's got their, their focus and their specialties. I am not focusing and specializing in, in teaching classical sounds, you know, I know some things about it. I know some basics. I know some, some fundamentals, but I'm not going to be wanting to, you know, <laughs> work uh, with yeah. people that, that, that want to do that. My focus is going to be on, I want to work mostly with singers that want to be able to do the sounds that I can do really well. And so that would be my advice too, for when you are looking for that guidance of with whatever that little mini obsession is, you should work with somebody that's qualified. If I'm working on those CVT sounds and I'm trying to understand what is overdrive and how I can control overdrive and what I can use overdrive for and how that's going to affect my singing, you should go to a CVT instructor. You shouldn't go to a classical instructor. You say overdrive to a classical instructor. You'd be like, what? <laughs> yeah. Put your voice in overdrive. No, no, no. <laughs> only sing, only sing middle power. <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't, don't sing louder than is beautiful. No, no, don't overdrive it. You know, <laughs> uh, they're gonna, you know, they're going to interpret that and go, I don't know what you're talking about. You got to go to somebody that understands well, what that obsession is, what, <laughs> you know, what information you're focused on. Well, we, this has been a lot of fun. We're definitely going to do this again. Just to maybe a, a finishing thought on how can, how can somebody find, if they find an obsession and they want to indulge it, what's the first step they should do? I like to, um, I would say to find a mentor for that specific sound. And that may even look like finding a singer that's doing, or a collection of singers that are doing that specific sound really well. So if it's the breathy sound, I can list you like a bunch of singers right now that are really good at breathy vocals because breathy vocals are something that I've studied, that I appreciate, and that I've wanted to put in my own voice. Um, so you need to find people. Okay, I really like this guy. I really like Jason Mraz, for example. I love the air in his voice. Um, so you go, I'm going to just listen to Jason Mraz over and over again. I'm going to, I'm going to listen to Jason Mraz sing one line of the phrase, and then I'm going to copy that line of the phrase and I'm going to record it and I'm going to listen back. And then I'm going to listen back to Jason Mraz. And then I'm going to listen to my recording. I'm going to go, that's not quite right. <laughs> right on this line, right here on this syllable, it, it didn't have as much air. You got to really get focused. And there's nothing better than this back and forth mimicking. A voice lesson is just you mimicking the teacher. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you see them open their mouth like, you know, and not... You copy that and they tell you, no, don't open your mouth like this. The only difference is they're telling you, you're not doing yes. what I'm doing. But when you're copying a singer, you need to do what they're doing without them telling you to do it, which means you have to watch and, and focus it, uh, focus in on all those little details and listen back to yourself to get that feedback because you don't have them saying you're not doing it. With a vocal coach, you can, of course, if I could get a lesson with Jason Mraz, I would, <laughs> you know, uh, maybe he wouldn't be very good at it, but I would try. Um, you know, so it, with a coach, you would find it's another mentor. You find somebody that's doing a sound really well that you like, go and study with them and try to work on that specific sound. See, you know, I, I really like this tone. Can we work on, can we work on this technique? How do we do it? So I think that would be my that would be my first advice is find somebody to copy, you know, whether that's a, a singer and they're listening to the song and going back and forth and recording yourself or whether it's in a lesson and then copying the teacher uh, doing it. My second piece of actionable advice would be actually don't just have one obsession. <laughs> so mm -hmm. whatever it is that you're interested in with your voice, if it's breathy vocals, um, in order for you to actually be practicing a thing, there needs to be things that differentiate that from other stuff. So if it's a breathy vocal, it means it's not like a, a tighter vocal. So if I have like, ah, this is not breathy. And I know that it's not breathy. In other words, like if something exists, there has to be something that it's, that is not it. So for yeah. breathiness to be a thing, you have to have not breathy, right? 
ah, uh, ah, uh, right? So I have to be able to do both of those things. So when you're practicing, you should actually not just do one thing only. You should be doing comparative tests. So that would be another, I think, really um, practical piece of advice would be, when, let's say you're singing that phrase of a song, do it multiple ways. Okay, desperado. Don't do it. Now do it breathy. Desperado. Do it both ways. Go back and forth. Record it. Did the change you thought you made actually manifest in the sound when you got that feedback? And that's to your point of expectation and reality. <laughs> you know, that, that's why uh, a feedback is so important and a coach is so important. But there's a lot of things you can learn yourself and you have yeah. to do it that way. Even with a coach, I mean, you're going to see them, what, once a week? You know, so if you see them once a week, twice a week or something, you still have a lot of practice to do by yourself. So you need some sort of mechanism to correct yourself. You need to start to be thinking about, yeah, that wasn't breathy. I could right. hear it. I could feel it. These are the things that I sense and I feel when it's breathy and I can hear it when I listen back and when it's not. It's this. So you should have multiple obsessions in rotation, at least, because then you can switch between them, which is also another value to doing it is um, it's better for your memory to be yeah. working between different things. It's not good for your memory to be doing one thing only. It's like if I'm trying to learn vocabulary uh, and you use the flashcard method. So you have a word and, you know, I'm trying to learn what does this word mean in a foreign language, you know? Okay, this is the word. Got it. And then you just keep repeating the word over and over again. Like nobody would do that too. If you, what do you do? You move it to the back of the deck. You have other vocabulary to look. Then the next time you get to that card, after going through all those cards, you've forgotten it. Mm -hmm. It's not right there at the forefront of your mind. Then when you relearn it again in that moment, even though it's difficult and you've forgotten it, that actually creates a stronger, more durable memory. So a, a piece of advice would be write out your little obsessions, put them on each on an individual flashcard yeah. for you to practice and cycle through them. Have at least a couple, three of them. So don't do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Do these comparisons of, well, I did this sound now let me do this sound. And that's a difficult process. It's, it's actually in the short term much more difficult because you lose the sound. After you stop practicing the breathy sound, you go, oh, I tried to find my breathy sound. Fuck, I, I lost my breathy sound. <laughs> you know, where's my breathy sound? I can't do it. That's normal. It's more difficult in the short term. It's actually better for your brain in the long term. Just like if you were to sit there all day with one word, you would feel great about knowing that one word. But it actually, a week later, you wouldn't know that one word as well as you would have if you had cycled through it, giving your brain a chance to forget it and then re-remember it. Yeah, so, so it's better this way because you learn more than one skill at once. A, <laughs> B, you learn the skills better because it's you're really integrating it into your long term memory. And I think C, it's just more fun. <laughs> it's more fun to have a couple of things going than just only only one thing. So yeah. though you have an obsession, have a couple. <laughs> yeah, don't limit yourself. Yeah, that's great. Well, I appreciate so much that you're taking the time to to be here today. And this is a very valuable discussion. I love it. Just remember, find and indulge your mini obsessions and don't limit it to just one. Something you mentioned uh, also earlier during this podcast is that how important it is for singers to know other singers and interact with other singers. And that is exactly where I created the Vibe Singing Community. It's a community for singers to get together, to exchange, to get feedback, and also learn. So we're going to end this podcast, but if you'd like to connect with Greg and myself and the Vibe community, then join our private Zoom call that's going to be starting now in five minutes. I'm going to, we'll have this private Zoom call. It's a Q&A call with all of my guest speakers. We're going to answer your questions. We're going to give you some personal advice and guidance so you get this connection unique connection as a singer with experts with guides with other singers so go ahead and check inside the description you'll find a link for the vibe singing community and thank you so much for tuning in today we'll see you next week with jordan mitchell have a great day everybody
All right. Have a good one, guys.